It's called multi-generational. Multi-generational. And this morning's sermon, I want to title Think Bigger, Thinking Bigger, Thinking Bigger Than We Usually Think. Let me try and frame this for us as we start this. Uh, Our God is called the Ancient of Days. He is eternal. (coughs) Excuse me. Swallowed a fly. (coughs) He is eternal. He has loved us with an everlasting love. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's great love is with us. Scripture says he has loved us eternally with a depth. His plans, the Bible says in the New Testament, are his eternal purpose. That means it wasn't just born here, it was born in eternity. God has a dream and a plan and a vision that the Bible says he has all the authority and all the power to bring into the conformity of his plan. He is working a plan and has been doing so from eternity. So uh, we tend to uh, measure uh, our place in this world by our little moment of understanding. We were born into a physical world, then we were born again. We became aware of a supernatural world. And most of us, or tend to, the temptation is to start thinking of the, the grand plan of God as it pertains to my life. But I want us to think a little bigger than that because there is a grand plan that God has had in mind. He's been working out this plan long before you and I were born. And this plan is likely to continue after you have gone to be with him. The danger of this thinking in our own frame of reference is that we just measure um, what God is trying to do by this generation or by my life or worse, by my nation or even narrower by my denomination or even narrower by my little world. Us four and no more. We're right. And the rest of them are wrong. And I think what God is calling for uh, across the world is for the church to expand their heart and expand their minds and for us to look a little broader than we've been looking. The ultimate call of the ascension gifting is to, until we all reach unity in the faith. Isn't that interesting? Now, there are people who have followed our king and have served him beautifully for thousands of years. Men and women who've served him in their specific spheres of life, they've loved him with their whole selves and they've served him and their actions have proved that love. They've pushed back darkness, they've freed the prisoners, they've preached the gospel, they've revealed their father, they've stood against injustice, worshiped God, been a testimony to their generation. The Bible says we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Let's go to Hebrews 12. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, there are a few things that he admonishes us to do. He says, throw off what hinders you and run with perseverance and fix your eyes on Jesus, right? Very beautiful scripture. But the writer to the Hebrews wants us to understand that you're not running this race in a vacuum. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And it starts the scripture with therefore. And I want to say whenever you see a therefore in the scripture, go and see what it's there for. Right? Therefore. And so the writer to the Hebrews says, therefore, we're surrounded. And if you go back Before that, you see he starts to talk about Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and Abraham and Gideon. He starts to talk about the heroes of faith who have launched kingdoms, who have shut the mouths of lions, who have quenched the flames, who have raised the dead. They were sawn in two. They were beaten. They were destitute, persecuted, ill-treated, and the world was not worthy of them. He goes, now, therefore... Since you're surrounded by that crowd, run your race with perseverance. But my race and your race is not in a vacuum. So people who understand this reality, who get what's going on, understand that their life finds its best value and meaning in the pursuit of God's leading as it relates to his plan. My greatest dream for my life is not to live the American dream. It's not just to have the white picket fence and the happy family, although that's nothing wrong with that. That's beautiful. The greatest passion and the greatest passion of your life and the greatest use of your life is to walk in obedience to this king who has a grander plan, a bigger scope, a more eternal weight of glory for your life. 
It's not a call to uniformity. I'm not saying we all have to do the same thing. We make up a body and it, it has many diverse parts, but the cause of the king needs business people and homemakers and clerics and educators and medical practitioners and civil servants and artists and politicians. It needs all of us. We all have our part to play because the previous generation played its part and it's our time now. They ran their race, but the great race is not over. They fought their fight, but there are more rounds. This, pro this race will probably not be over when I've finished. I have something to do and then I have something to hand off. Someone else must run this race. So I must focus on my race for sure, but the kingdom cause is best served if I can think a little bit bigger than just my race. And I understand that this is a relay and not just a sprint. So how do I best position my life to work with people who are around me and work with people who will follow me? so that together we can win. The last call of the Old Testament is this great passion in, in Malachi's heart because he says, I'm gonna send John the Baptist. He basically he's gonna say, I'm gonna send the Messiah, but before him, I'm gonna send Elijah. I'm gonna send a John the Baptist in front of him. And the role of John the Baptist, he said, is, he, I, I, and you can hear Malachi's going, oh, I hope this, I really hope he gets it right. Because he says, his job is to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. And he's talking about Israel as a nation. And he's going, I want Israel to, to, to turn back to the faith of their fathers. I want them to remember what I did for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and how I led Moses and then led them into the promised land. I want them to remember David and the victories and the songs. I want, to, I want the, this generation to turn back and say, surely this is our God. And so John the Baptist arrives on the scene. He's shouting to the, he said, you better get a new brain. You better take a tr brain transplant. Repent because the kingdom, not repent because your sins are vast. Repent because the kingdom is near. Because Jesus is about to show up here. And if you don't take a different way of thinking, if you don't change the way you think, you're gonna miss this massive opportunity of this generation. And Jesus comes and preaches to the generation and because their hearts have not been turned back, they reject him and he weeps over Jerusalem and he says, I came to you in this moment and this was your moment. You should have received me, but instead you rejected me. And he said, because of this, within a generation on one of these stones that are massive and beautiful are gonna stay together. And John writes in his great gospel, he came to his own but his own would not receive him. There's a call that still remains in the spirit. Could we turn the hearts of the fathers and the parents to their children? Could we turn the hearts of the children to their parents? Because there is something of a supernatural something that the Lord wants to hand off to another generation. He wants uh, a young people to learn from us, to take everything that we've had and to move forward from that place. He doesn't want one generation to live and die and then a next generation to live and die. And this generation, because they learned nothing from this generation, they have to go back to the starting point and fight again for all the same ground that this generation previously had already won. My presupposition is that we're going to portray, all of us, a great story of God's love and redemption throughout thousands of years of history, portrayed by a cast of billions of actors. And when we stand and watch this great portrayal of human history and we see it in one go, all that we're going to be able to say is, great is his faithfulness, great is his name. Because woven through the history of mankind after billions of actors have played our part, we're gonna see the amazing grace and the kindness and the beauty of our God and we'll shout and extol his name. He is the gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. 
There's a desire in God's heart, I believe, for our, his people to have enough humility to be able to learn from one another, to make smooth transitions between generations, from one generation to another. The great lament of death is the loss of knowledge. I remember I was just coming into my teen years and I was not doing that well. And at that stage, my grandmother passed and my grandfather came to live with us. And he was a regimental sergeant major who didn't like young boys. He thought the best thing for them was discipline. So he walked into the house and he was irritated by default. And my sister could do nothing wrong and I could do nothing right. And when you're 13, that's like gasoline and fire. We saw eye to belly button, he and I. We didn't, we didn't gel well. And then he died. And I remember thinking, he was one of the most gifted mechanics anybody ever knew. He was, ran a, he, he, was in the, he was in the Air Force, he ran uh, during the war, he kept the planes in the air. Ran an immaculate shop, famous for it. Really gifted with his hands. And he got frustrated at the end of his life because he started losing his sight and he couldn't do stuff. And he knew, he had all this knowledge and he couldn't do it. And so then he'd say, come here, help me. And oh, that was just horrible. <laughs> he was irritated with me before I started. And so that's where we started. And I often wondered, wouldn't it be nice if we could... Imagine if I could just put a syringe into his brain and just suck out all the knowledge he had and then inject it into me. That would have been cool. And so movies like The Matrix have gone down the same theme. Let's just upload. But there is a mechanism to do this. This is the intent of God. If I can turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to the parents, there can be a transference of everything they know to them. Malachi, the Italian Malachi. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction, which happened 40 years after Jesus died. So I want to talk about a couple of precepts that I've discovered in my walk with the Lord that I think you will find are universal. And uh, whether you believe in them or not, they are at work in your life right now. But when you understand a precept and you start to submit to the precept, you can receive the benefits of that precept. And they have uh, to do with this idea of the generations turning their hearts to one another, that there is a leaning towards one another in respect and trust, and that, that opens up strengths and differences that allows for uh, a different generation. But there are some precepts that I'd like to suggest either way, one for younger people whom I would call children, and one for the older people I'll call parents, and we're going to start with children. So here it comes, children, here's the precept. Honor releases inheritance. Honor releases inheritance. Said another way, we will have an inheritance from whatever we consistently honor. You'll have no inheritance from what you consistently dishonor. You will have an inheritance from what you consistently honor. Jesus said, uh, the scripture says, honor what is honorable, right? And Jesus said, the, the, the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must honor them, but don't do what they do. Don't emulate them, but honor them. There is a place of honor when we honor what is right, when we honor what is honorable, that we start to receive that from us. So Jesus said the principle holds true. If you honor a prophet because they're a prophet, you'll receive the prophet's reward. If you honor a righteous man because he is a righteous man, you'll receive the righteous man's reward. I found this out many years ago. We, we were ministering in another church and a lady came up to me. She was quite nervous. And she'd heard that Michelle was a prophet and she said to me, Michelle was sitting on a bar stool in a, we were in a kitchen. And she said, do you think I could speak to the prophet? <laughs> I was like, I, I, which prophet? She goes, Michelle. And I said, certainly. I'm sure. She says, what, what should I do? 
Because in her world, someone's a prophet. That's somebody who's deeply connected to God. She has a great respect and honor for a prophet. She said, can I just go and talk to her? I said, yeah. Just go and sit next to her and talk to her. So she, very shyly, she, she sat next to Michelle and said, excuse me, can I talk to you? Michelle said, sure. And she said, would you pray for me? And she, she said, I have an autoimmune disease. And Michelle said, I'd love to. Michelle laid hands on her and just prayed a simple prayer. That woman got healed. Because, because she said in her heart, that woman is a prophet. And because she honored. Now, that's not our style. We don't walk around like, you know what I mean? But, but, uh, but I'm trying to show you something. She honored Michelle as a prophet. She received the prophet's reward. Honor releases inheritance. This presumes that children have their hearts set towards honoring their parents and their elders. Now, I'm going to tell a story my daughter's going to hate, but she'll love me anyway. <laughs> she was 15. I was driving her to school one day, and she said, I had silly, you know, sometimes as parents, you make silly jokes. And I joked humorously and said to her, when you turn 16, you can have whatever car you can afford. Because I didn't want her to assume that I was just going to automatically buy her a car. And I wanted her to have some work ethic. And so she was working two jobs. She was teaching piano and she was babysitting. So she says to me, she said, Dad, man, I'm, I'm working, but I don't think I'm ever going to be able to afford a car. And, I, and she says, I know you won't help. And I was like, bad father, bad father. You know, I was like, let me just. So I said, no, 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 I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I, definitely, I absolutely am going to help you. But why don't we ask the Lord to give you a car? She said, you know, we're getting close to the school. She goes, absolutely, let's do that. So I said, Lord, quick prayer. Lord, could you give Nicole a car? That'd be cool. And she says, amen. And then, boop, out she goes and we're done. That's Friday morning. Saturday, I come to the church. There's a men's meeting here. And we're sitting in a, and there's a quiet moment and I'm sitting in worship and I'm doing the math. And I'm going, I said, Lord, I've given away more cars than you've given me. I'm doing the math on it. I, got think, I think you're behind on car giving. My sister calls from South Africa and says, I've just been feeling like the Lord spoke to me and I, I would like to give two and a half thousand dollars to Nicole to buy a car. So I was like, wow, that's pretty generous because it's almost 20 times that amount in, in her money. We get a call from some people. They go, hey, can you come around? We go around. They go, hey, um, got a job, new company car. We have this car, we prayed about it, and felt like the Lord said we should give it to you. Very cool. But it's a, it's a red two-door V6 sports car. Um, that's not going to my daughter. <laughs> so Michelle drove that car for, for the next five years. And Michelle had a Ford Focus, which is the car Nicole had learned to drive on. And that became Nicole's car. That Sunday, the next Sunday, we get to church, and on the seat that Nicole usually sits on, there's an envelope, and it's got $600 in it. Now, Michelle and I decided we were gonna pay for the insurance of the car, so now I stepped back a little, and I said, okay, one prayer, we have a car, we have the first $2,500 to service the car, we have the first 600 bucks of gas money, insurance is taken care of. She doesn't have her full license yet. She's got a learner's permit. She can't even drive the car alone. So I went to the Lord. I said, Lord, if you're in this, if we're in this mode, I have a list of a few things. Can we, can we have this discussion? So I got a few things. But I, it was so, you know, it was so obvious. I, I, the Lord was trying to make a point. And so I sat with the Lord. I said, Lord, could you explain this to me? What are, you, what are we talking about here? What's going on? And I felt like the Lord took me you know, to the scripture in, in Ephesians 6 where he says, honor your children, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it might go well with you in the land that the Lord is giving you or the land of your inheritance. Honor is the primary vehicle of release of inheritance. Honor your father and mother so that it may go well with you in the land. It's the first command with a promise and a principle. I wanna to say to the young people in the room, if you're here, please listen to me. Honor your father and mother. 
because it will release inheritance into your life. And I realized the truth. On this battlefield of giving and receiving cars, Michelle and I had fought a battle. We'd given away motor cars. We had sold many motor cars way cheaper than their current market value because it was, we were selling it to youth leaders and people who needed it. And so on this battlefield, the Lord had tested us and we had sacrificed and given, not when it was convenient only, but sometimes when it wasn't convenient and we gave and we said, bless you. And the Lord said, on this battlefield, Michelle and I have fought and we have won and we've cut down enemies and we've proven ourselves generous and on this battlefield of motor cars, we have won victory. So when my daughter who has honored us says, oh Lord, it would be nice if I got a boof. She doesn't have to fight for it because it's hers by inheritance. Because if you honor, you ride in on the back of those you honor. And every inch that they have taken at the tip of their sword, at the consequence of their faith, by their effort, you ride in and it's all yours freely given because it's inheritance. And inheritance is something somebody else worked for and they give to you for free. A salary is something you work for, but an inheritance is something somebody else worked for and you get access to it. So I'm telling you, principle. Honor releases inheritance. You consistently dishonor, you have no inheritance from whatever you consistently dishonor. But you will have an inheritance from whatever you consistently honor. Now, let me just hit the pause and turn a little on a dime here. For those of you who didn't have great parents in the kingdom, who weren't wonderful, who don't have a spouse, who haven't been all of this, you can receive an inheritance from whatever and whomever you choose to honor. You don't even have to know them. I choose to honor that because I like where that person is going. So I honor them and I receive the reward even though I've never met them personally. That's for a few people in the room. If, I don't know how it happened, I don't know when it happened, but at some stage in her early teen years, my daughter chose to honor her mother and her father. And that's not because we were always perfectly honorable. It's because she made a choice internally. I'm gonna honor them. And in the areas where we have fought and won victories, she gets it for free. Many other areas I could talk about. In, in the areas of our strength where we fought bloody battles and won, she walked in and just said, oh, it would be so, boom, the Lord gave it to her. It's her inheritance. It was our fight. Yeah. I think what happens in generations is that there's such a habit of dishonor that this generation fights forward and the moment this child consistently dishonors their parents, they step off being able to ride on their victory, and now they're on their own two feet, and now every step that they're gonna advance is at the tip of their own sword. And you didn't just get this piece for free, now you have to fight your way forward, just like we had to. We've gotta tell the stories to the next generation. We've gotta tell our kids. Let me tell you what the Lord did. Let me tell you who the Lord is. Let me show you what he's done in our life. These are the things we've heard in Noam, Psalm 78 says. Things our ancestors told us. We'll not hide them from their descendants and tell them to the next generation. The praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he's done. He decreed statutes for Jacob. He established law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. The basic expectation of God was that we sit down with our kids and we explain to them the victories God has given us and the things that he's shown us about himself and the things that we know to be true. I know this to be true about my God. This is not theory, I've tested this a number of times and as Russell was saying earlier, it has settled in my heart, I've meditated on what he's done, it has taken root in me and I say, this is my God. I'll, you can take it to the bank, I'll step into the circumstance because I know whom I believed. And you can't move me off this faith. So I don't need to have it all buttoned down when I step into the unknown because I have the God that I know. <laughs> 
And we've stepped into a number of unknowns together. And he's always been faithful. Trying to make me nervous. Does that make sense? 1 Peter. Listen to this, young people and, and old people alike. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore. God much prefers me to humble myself rather than have one of you come and humble me. I'd much rather I did it myself. Parents, let's talk to parents for a bit. Do you get the principle? Whether you believe it or not, I believe it's going to work in your life. I believe it's a precept. And uh, you can choose to work with it. You know, when I, when I learned that, when I first understood that honor is the vehicle of inheritance, I suddenly stopped speaking poorly about some of the people I was freely speaking poorly about. And I stopped, and I looked around. I started, I started to honor everything that was honorable. I stopped picking on what wasn't perfect. And I started to honor what was, per- was beautiful. I want to just honor that man. That was a father in the faith. That was a good man. That was a good woman. I want to honor what they did. Because I want an inheritance from that. I stopped criticizing other denominations. Because I want an inheritance. Some of the Methodists and some of the Presbyterians and some of the Catholics have done more for the king and his kingdom in this great pageant. And I want that inheritance. Amen? Amen. You guys look a little nervous about that. (laughs) Let's talk to parents. Parents, trust releases heritage. Let me say it another way. You will have an heritage from whatever you consistently believe in. You'll have no heritage from what you consistently doubt. Just as it may for some be hard to honor what is not altogether honorable, we at Northern say honor what is honorable, and you don't have to honor what's dishonorable. So it's also maybe difficult to trust somebody who hasn't always been trustworthy. So we say you trust What is trustworthy? We celebrate strengths. We believe beyond them. We trust in people. Give them another chance. Has anyone ever taught your teenager how to drive? There's a lesson in trust right there. As you get in the car and you go, okay, let's go forward. Oh, slower. This is like the driving lessons for life. I've discovered that if I consistently doubt younger people, I have no heritage from them. They have no desire to take on what, I've, what I have to give. But if I consistently believe in them, they go, yeah, thank you, you think I could do that? I go, yeah, you could. Well, I'd like to do that. You have no heritage from what you consistently doubt, but you will have a heritage from what you consistently believe in. If you consistently give them encouragement and speak life and give them opportunities, you'll find that they, they take on what God's given you to do. Ephesians 6. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The three verses just before this one were the ones we spoke about. For some reason, they were not in my notes. But Ephesians 6.1 First commandment with a promise speaks to the younger people. This one speaks to the parents. Bring them up under the discipline and instruction of the Lord in the nurture. The Greek is in paideia. In the training of a child. 
And the admonition, the, the word means literally put them in mind. Driving on the, 80, on the 285, that's how we learned. Nicole and I learned how to drive because I go, let's just knock this out. So we, we just got on the 285 and I said, just drive. She did beautifully. I'm, we're driving and I'm going, I'm putting her in mind. How many cars behind you? What do you think this truck's gonna do? See that guy's weaving in and out? Do you think he's gonna come into your lane? How far do you think you should be behind this guy? I'm putting her in mind. I'm just putting her in mind. We're driving between two big 18-wheelers. How are you feeling? <laughs> you liking this lane? It's not that the scripture says you shouldn't correct. It just says don't exasperate them. And the best way to exasperate somebody who's younger than you is to treat them younger than they actually are. When you have a 17 year old, don't treat them like a 12 year old. Treat them like an 18 year old or a 19 year old. The opposite of exasperation is believing to the point where the person that you're believing in is beginning to doubt you. Are you, you think I could do that? Of course you could. Seriously. Yeah. Contending for the faith publication says about that scripture we just read. It doesn't mean that parents cannot consistently correct a child, but that parents are not to create a situation where the child feels hopeless and despairs of ever doing anything right. This is a problem where the source of the conflict is the heart of the parent rather than the behavior of the child. I thought it went really quiet in here. <laughs> Parents cannot justify unloving behavior and chronic criticism under the cloak of helping your child. Parents do not exasperate your children. The plague of our youth is a broken spirit, crushed and discouraged by constant criticism and rebuke and the habit of discipline too strictly enforced. Paul writes to the Ephesians, which is the scripture we just read, which was a center of Roman emperor worship. And later he writes to the Colossians, the same scripture we're gonna read about a father's obligation uh, uh, to assume, which is in, in the culture, they assumed the father had absolute power. And Paul writes into that context and says, fathers, if you want us to go beyond you, stop exasperating your children. Kaufman's commentary says the notion that a father had any obligation towards a child simply did not exist in non-Jewish elements of a pagan society. As a result of the prevailing attitude, many unwanted or despised children were exposed at birth to the elements, wild beasts or other forms of horrible death. I was reading uh, one letter that a guy wrote back to his wife while she was in Rome and he said to her, uh, you know, very loving. Oh, I miss you so much. I I'm, I'm, can't wait to get back to you. And he goes, listen, if the baby you have is a girl, then just put her out. But if it's a boy, then keep him. I'd like to see him when I get back. And then, oh, but you know, I just, you, you're wonderful. And the, the casual uh, attitude towards a child, uh, they, uh, in their Roman culture, they, they were, a child would be born, they put it at the feet of the father. And if he stooped to pick it up, then the child would live. And if he didn't, they would take it out and leave it on the street. Into that environment, Paul writes to fathers and says, listen, I, I need you to take a different attitude towards the, the children in your household. I just stop exasperating. Stop assuming that you have all command and start relating to them as though they're going to take care of you one day. Yeah. Colossians 3, fathers do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Can I say it again? Trust Trust is the mechanism of heritage. If you learn to trust somebody younger than you and trust them more than they think they need to be trusted, they'll start to work for you and with you 
they'll start to appreciate the fact that you were the one who called it out of them. You were the one who recognized it when they themselves didn't even recognize it. I've told you the story many times, but I'm gonna say it again. I was at Bible college, I was first year student. The dean of the college came to me and said, I'd like you to speak at this conference. And I said, that's great, who else is speaking there? And he said, the senior pastor of a 20,000 member church, the, uh, an internationally recognized prophet and the head of South, uh, all of the intercessors in South Africa, and you. I, said, I can't speak with those people. And he said, of course you can, because God's given you this gift. And when he said it, it settled in me. Boom. Dropped like a, like a weight. I was like, yeah. But until that very second, it was not there. But when he said it, it established it in me. Never forgot him for that. He said a bunch of other stuff that wasn't complimentary. But I forgot all of that. <laughs> there are some young people around you that have hopes and dreams. And I want to tell you, if you would just see them and say it out loud, you'd be astounded at what the Lord could do through you. Lastly, I'm close. William Barclay said, a Roman father had absolute power over his family. He could sell them as slaves, work them in the fields, even in chains. He could take the law into his own hands because he was the law. He could punish them as he liked. He could even inflict the death penalty on his child. Let me just say this. I'll ask the question, would you be willing to have your heart turned? Younger people, would you be willing to have the Lord help you turn your hearts back to your, your parents and to older people and to, and, to, and to start looking upon them as people who have value and people who have impact and people who have something to say. One of the great tragedies that I think is going on right now in this generation is this generation of finding that they'd rather ask unknown strangers on the internet for advice than they will, will ask their parents. Hey, what do you think about this? 20, 20 unknown strangers will comment on them. They'll choose the one that suits them best and go ahead and do that before they even ask their parents. Young people, would you be willing for the Lord to turn your heart and turn back to your parents? Because I'm telling you, in that there is safety and in that there is massive inheritance. And I want to say to the older people, would you be willing to have the Lord turn your heart towards the younger people and start to give away what you have? I have discovered this truth Everything that you give away to a younger person, not only blesses them, but you never lose it. It stays with you. But now there's two of us. You cannot give it away fast enough. Whatever you give away to somebody that you're believing in, it will manifest, it doubles, but it doesn't leave you. What a blessing this is. Now, this is my dream. Imagine this. In my life, and Michelle and I have been able to make some inroads into darkness in some specific areas, but we, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface because we're supposed to do this in a team of all of you. And in the areas of your strength and in your perseverance, you may have, have broken through in areas we've, we've never yet learned. And so we need to reach across the aisle and say, thank you for your strength. And could I just piggyback off what you're doing? Can I learn to honor you and then receive the same reward that you're getting? Can I get the inheritance of your hard work? And, and I think that there's something, that's why I'm saying the, the call is to think a little bigger than just my little ministry in my life. I have to start looking at other people and just honoring them and saying, thank you for what you've done. But then as, a, as an older generation, we actually have to start saying to the younger generation, we trust you. We actually trust you. The average age of pastors in this, these United States is 53. The average age of megachurch pastors is 68. That's too old. And one of the problems that, that people are discovering in the church right now, in this United States, in these United States, is that they're not young pastors coming through not enough it's a symptom Are you willing to let the Lord turn your heart and start giving away 
and, and not, just, not just ruling, giving real authority, giving real space, giving real recognition to younger people. Because, man, they'll amaze you. I'm going to close in a prayer. But I wonder if you would just turn your heart with me to the Lord and say, Lord, you can, you can do it in me. Lord, you, uh, you've called us individually. And for that, Lord, there is no measure of thanks that is appropriate. That you have put your hand on us. That you have looked upon us and said, I want you to come and serve me. What an honor. But Lord, you've called more than us individually. You've called us together in team. Lord, not just our church. You've called churches all around the city. Not just our city, Lord, but our nation. Not just our nation, but nations. Not just in this time, but in the times past and in the days to come. And so, Lord, I'm willing. Would you turn my heart? And would you turn, Lord, the hearts of the children to their parents? And would you turn the hearts of the parents to their children? And would you give us, Lord, a different, different moment of handover? I pray, Lord, that there will be a wholesale giving over of every victory we've ever had to the next generation and that they would start, Lord, from the very best of what we've been able to achieve. I'm asking, Lord, that not, not another generation goes by where we have to start from the beginning again, but Lord, would you, would you help them to be launched like arrows in the hand of a warrior beyond our position into the darkness to make astounding new ways. I pray for every young person, Lord, would you give them wisdom beyond their years to turn to their parents and honor them so that this inheritance is made available? All hail to you. We give you honor, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.